I think that people who are willing to get the vaccine need to understand how it works and how to interpret the, the newspapers and the media uh, with a lot of uh, questions about it. So we all are familiar with this picture. Coronavirus means that there's a corona and these are spike proteins on the surface. And even with the new variations and strains of the virus, which we can discuss in the Q&A, these spike pro proteins are the targets for all the vaccines that are available worldwide. And that has stayed steady. Now, what I'm gonna show you is a video clip that I got, and I have a license to show you this video clip. So let me move on to the uh, next one. One second. The purpose of a vaccine is to mimic an infection, activating the body's immune response, but without causing the illness. Conventional vaccines usually contain a weakened or inactivated virus or a piece of a viral protein called an antigen. These viral elements do not cause disease, but they trick the immune system into thinking that an infection has occurred so that it responds by producing antibodies against the virus. RNA vaccines are a new generation of vaccines. Instead of a protein antigen, they contain mRNA, meaning messenger RNA. As its name suggests, mRNA is basically a messenger carrying genetic message from DNA to protein. In order to function, a human cell needs to constantly produce proteins based on genetic information in its DNA. Because DNA is located in the nucleus of the cell, and protein synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm, an intermediate molecule is required to transmit the information. mRNA copies the information from DNA and brings it to the cytoplasm, where it is translated into protein. mRNA consists of four basic building blocks called A, U, C, and G. The information it carries is the sequence of these letters. RNA vaccines contain mRNA strands that have the information for making the viral antigen, usually a viral spike protein. Once inside the body's cells, the mRNA is translated into protein, the antigen, by the same process the cells use to make their own proteins. The antigen is then displayed on the cell surface where it is recognized by the immune system. From here, the sequence of events is similar to that of a conventional vaccine. RNA vaccines are easier and safer to produce than conventional vaccines. Conventional vaccines typically require growing large amounts of infectious viruses, usually in chicken eggs, and then inactivating them. Vaccines produced this way are at risks of being contaminated with live viruses and allergens from egg culture. Such risks do not exist with RNA vaccines because mRNA molecules can be synthesized in a cell-free system using a DNA template that contains information for making the viral protein. The mRNA is made from the same building blocks as natural mRNA, so it has the same chemical composition as natural mRNA. The relative simplicity of the production process makes it easier to standardize and scale, enabling rapid responses to emerging pandemics. In case the virus mutates, it's also simple to change the mRNA sequence to match the mutation. RNA vaccines do not change your DNA. This is because in order to do so, the mRNA must convert into DNA, enter the nucleus, and integrate into the cell's DNA. This is a complex, multi-step process requiring action of several enzymes that the cell does not have. Instead, the cell has plenty of enzymes that can readily destroy the mRNA, so the mRNA is usually degraded after the protein is made. When enough people in a community are vaccinated, the whole community, including the individuals that were not vaccinated, is protected against the disease. This phenomenon is known as herd immunity. Herd immunity is possible because a pathogen cannot spread without a sufficient number of vulnerable hosts. An analogy is the spread of wildfires. A wildfire only spreads where there is vegetation or fuel for it to burn. It would stop at a river or a large open space. 
These are called fire breaks. Vaccinated individuals essentially serve as fire breaks, preventing spread of infections caused by pathogens. Herd immunity is important because not everyone can be vaccinated. Often, the very young, very old, and immunocompromised people must rely on vaccinated individuals to stop disease outbreaks. To note, however, that the number of vaccinated individuals must be great enough for community protection to occur, just like a fire break must be large enough to stop a fire. Okay, one second. So let me just go over a couple of key points. Uh, first is that the RNA, the messenger RNA is uh, the instrument for uh, telling the cell to make these spike proteins. The messenger RNA, both the Moderna and the Pfizer, are situated in an oily shell, which is then injected into you. And it's fairly fragile, which makes it more difficult. Uh, and that's why some of these vaccines, particularly Pfizer, requires an extremely low temperature to maintain the stability of this whole structure. Now, when the cells produce all of these spike proteins, antibodies are produced and then destroy uh, the, uh, the virus. However, it's much more complicated as you can imagine. And the reason I'm just gonna complicate this a little bit is for the following reason that you read in the papers, well, how long do these antibodies last? And are they specific enough? And who has the antibodies? The immune system is very complicated. There are essentially two components to our immune system. One is called the humoral system and the other is the cellular. So the humoral or the B cells or memory B cells as well, produce antibodies, deals with the antigens, that's the spike protein from the virus that are freely circulating uh, or outside the infected cell. So in other words, floating around in your blood, these antibodies really knock off uh, the uh, and identify the spike proteins and the virus. However, there's a whole nother component. How does our body immune system deal with infections that enter the cells? And so there's a, a series of some, something out of straight of, out of Hollywood casting. They're helper T cells, they're killer T cells, and they're memory T cells. So these different kinds of T cells are an advantage for uh, both short-term and long-term dealing with infection or reinfection, preventing reinfection. So when we read about antibodies maybe dissipating over a period of time, we have memory T cells and we have memory B cells and nobody at the moment has done a big enough study to measure exactly how long the memory lasts for so that if you get vaccinated and a year later, you have no circling antibodies, but if the memory cells are able to react, then you are still safe and vaccinated. Now, how do the scientific trials work? So as you know, you get uh, two doses. So for disclosure, I was part of the Moderna vaccine trial back in August and I was given two doses, not told whether I was vaccinated or placebo. And then they followed us for a period of time to see how many people who were vaccinated, didn't know we were vaccinated, got the virus, and how many in the placebo group got the virus. And that's where it showed up that the vaccine group, there were just eight cases in the placebo group, 162 cases in this particular component of the Pfizer trial. So this is how the studies were done. And I need to emphasize having been a subject in this uh, study right from the beginning, I can honestly say, and as somebody who has um, managed uh, clinical trials, that these clinical trials were superbly run. Uh, the uh, due diligence, the close way that I was followed, the weekly phone calls, the diary that I had to keep, the frequent blood tests, uh, were very uh, well organized. Now, they last week decided that, that they would uh, unblind the study. So I was formally told that I was received the vaccine, but I have agreed to participate in the study. So over the next 18 months, they will know what's happening to my T cells and my B cells. Now, a couple of points to remember because of the anti-vaxxers uh, need to emphasize these points. COVID-19 mRNA vaccines cannot give somebody COVID-19. 
it does do not use the light, they do not use the live virus to stimulate the immune response. It does not affect or interact with our DNA as the video clip uh, uh, indicated. It never enters the nucleus of the cell and the cells break down and get rid of the mRNA soon after it's finished using the instructions. Now, there's been a lot of uh, um, talk about, well, you know, this has been done in 10 months. Uh, how many corners did they cut? And is this really uh, um, a good approach to it? I need to inform you that the research on mRNA vaccines has been going on for decades, for decades. And unfortunately, uh, people have not been emphasizing this enough. So go, work going on at the NIH, as I will explain to you later, and at BioNTech in Germany. Uh, and the vaccines have been used for producing for flu, Zika, rabies, and cytomegalovirus. So in these particular areas, there is a lot of research and understanding how the mRNA works. And this is more than a 10 month phenomenon. Future mRNA vaccine technology may allow for one vaccine to provide protection for multiple diseases, which will be truly amazing. And as the video clip indicated that if we are unlucky that there is a drift in the virus with the new types of viruses uh, coming, uh, um, hitting the public, that this vaccine approach can be readily changed very quickly and new vaccines can be produced. Last but by no means least, Moderna has been in the business of cancer research and uses mRNA to trigger the immune system to target specific cancer cells. We've known for a long time that the immune system wants to get rid of our cancer cells, but is blocked to do so. This technology is proving very, very beneficial in treating cancers, and you're gonna see a lot more of this in the near future. In terms of safety, decades of experience being used for other diseases, Pfizer and Moderna, no serious side effects during the trials. Phase one trial, animal study, phase two and three, over two to four months, and 37,000 subjects followed. Planned long-term follow-up for people like yours truly in terms of indicating what the effects are. And the questions are, is there a long-term risk? So I think we need to understand that when we are testing a vaccine on 37,000 people, there is a risk that when we start vaccinating millions of people, that very rare events may occur. So uh, that is something that we need to understand and we need to follow very closely. However, rare events that theoretically may occur are unknown and at the moment there are no long-term risks. And this needs to be weighed up in terms of versus known risks of COVID-19 deaths, hospitalization and long-term illness. As Andy points out, this illness is not over for a number of people once you recover through the initial phase, long-term uh, blood disorders, strokes, uh, lung problems, heart problems. This is, can be a long-term serious disease. And we know that. We know that there's a risk of death. And for people on this conference call, probably that's between two to 3% uh, will die. And then there's a 10 to 15% a risk of hospitalization. This is, these are the known risks of COVID versus very theoretical risks, unknowns that have been uh, um, emphasized by some anti-vaxxers. What about the comparison of the side effects of Pfizer versus Moderna? Turns out that the side effects are largely the same. And if you've had Shingrix, that's what it was like, uh, or the flu vaccine, that's what it was like. Now, I'm going to show you, as I begin to wind this down, I'm going to show you something that I love this part of the story. Who were the people behind the Pfizer, Moderna, and NIH leadership? I, I love stories of people. So the NIH, uh, um, most of the work was done in Fauci's uh, department, the Dale and Betty Bumpers Vaccine Research Center. And there were three people who really have made a difference. Barney Graham, who's an MD, PhD, has been doing mRNA research for about a decade. So has John Mascola. Kismekia Corbett, uh, who's a PhD, is just 34. She's an African-American woman, a brilliant scientist, 
who has played a very major part in the development of the vaccines. Now, we need to understand that it wasn't Moderna who produced this original research. Moderna uses the original research produced by the NIH. So the NIH did the original research, they partnered with Moderna, who had the other expertise to run the trial, et cetera. So much of the original work was done at the NIH. What about Moderna? So Moderna is based in Boston. The uh, co-founder and chair uh, is Nuba Afayan. He's an Armenian of, of Armenian descent. His family escaped the genocide in Turkey and he was born in Lebanon. And he's the co-founder of Moderna. He's a PhD, he's 58 years old, has dozens of patents to his name. Absolutely brilliant uh, individual. Stefan Bancel is a Frenchman who is the chief executive officer. And Tal Zaks uh, is the MD, PhD, who's the chief medical officer, who's an Israeli, graduated from Ben-Gurion University Medical School in Besheva. Uh, it's, it's hard not to be amazed at the number of immigrants to our shores that have played such a vital role in development of the Moderna vaccine. But what about Pfizer and BioNTech? So BioNTech is a small biotech company in Germany and it was started by two Turkish immigrants. And if some of you know a little bit about uh, uh, Turks who live in, in Germany, that they've often been ostracized by these two German physicians, 55 and 53, husband and wife, were doing a lot of work on mRNA vaccines. And when the pandemic hit, they contacted Pfizer to become their collaborator. And Pfizer jumped in straight away and, and uh, provided a lot of the backbone. Now let's look at the Pfizer. Who's the head of Pfizer? The head of Pfizer is Albert Bourla. He's a 59 year old veterinarian who's a chairman and CEO. And this is the amazing part. He was born in Thessaloniki, Salonika in Greece. Some of you know the history of the Jewish community in Greece that Thessaloniki was a population, had a population of Jews of about 60,000 prior to the uh, uh, advent, uh, invasion by the Nazis. And out of the 60,000, 50,000 were slaughtered. 50,000 out of 60,000 uh, Salonika Jews were, were slaughtered. And this was a community largely made up of descendants of the expulsion from Spain. Bourla, both his parents were Holocaust survivors, both of them. And he uh, moved to the States eventually, married, and has been instrumental in making sure that uh, Pfizer provided enough vaccines for Israel. And you can probably imagine why he did that. Let me change uh, tax and talk about the other vaccines that are gonna come on the market. Ox Oxford's AstraZeneca, so the research done at Oxford University in the UK, AstraZeneca is their partner. Johnson & Johnson works with Janssen & Janssen from, from Holland. And then we have Novavax, the Chinese and the Russian uh, vaccines. All of these vaccines are the traditional approach where you take uh, a portion of the DNA of the COVID, vir uh, COVID virus and you insert it into an adenovirus. An adenovirus is something that causes the common cold and you can manipulate that adenovirus to make it uh, uh, non-effective and doesn't cause symptoms, and then use that as the transmitter around the body. And this is the traditional approach. It's more complicated to manufacture, not to distribute. Distribution is much easier. As you know, AstraZeneca doesn't require uh, extremely low temperatures, nor will Johnson & Johnson, but the manufacture is more complicated and the risks of side effects and uh, egg allergies, et cetera, is higher. We know very little about the Chinese vaccines and we know almost nothing about the Russian vaccines. And I was very saddened to see that the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank has uh, contracted with Russia because they've been really shut out of the Western vaccines. Uh, so the, this is just a schematic of the DNA uh, from the uh, from the coronavirus, which is in the adenovirus and the cascade process to produce the same spike proteins. And the end result is the same, but uh, the mechanism is different. 
This is a list of all of the vaccines that are available worldwide. And you can see only two are mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. The rest are <coughs> inactivated, <coughs> excuse me, uh, adenoviruses or similar. Now the uh, video clip uh, did show you about herd immunity and I love the analogy of fire and uh, having a fire break. And as Anthony Fauci has pointed out that we need about 70 to 85% of the population uh, immune uh, in order to uh, stop the spread of this virus. Now, if the more uh, aggressive variation that, that came out of the UK becomes the prevalent virus in the United States, this number may go up a little bit higher. So how do we work out what is herd immunity? Well, it's people who are vaccinated, obviously, and vaccination requires, for these two uh, vaccines I described, two shots, and then you have to wait about 10 days after your second shot until you really are immune. But then what about people who've been infected? Are they uh, immune? And we don't really know this. That's the difficulty. So people who have um, a mild or asymptomatic case of the COVID-19 may not be producing enough antibodies nor uh, have stimulated their memory T or B cells. And that's the dilemma. People are certainly very sick. Uh, we know from the convalescent antibodies serum that they do produce a lot of uh, antibodies, but for everybody else, we're not sure how much of the post-infection immunity will help the vaccines and speed up herd immunity. Now, uh, one of my talks, I talked about uh, Manaus in, uh, in um, Brazil, uh, in, the Amazon, in the Amazon jungle, a large port city, and how they had a massive attack of, uh, of COVID uh, throughout the summer uh, with a huge death toll, huge death toll. And it's uh, amazing to read about Manaus because the number of people who's, uh, the number of families who left bodies out on the street because there was nowhere to put the bodies. This was an example of uh, herd immunity. And because we see that all of a sudden the, uh, the infection rate uh, began to disappear. Now, there are some in the United States who've advocated, well, we'll wait for herd immunity in the United States. For us to get to this point, let me emphasize this, for us to get to this point, we need to have occurring in the United States about two and a half million people dying. I can go through the maths with you. It's fairly straightforward. But for us to have herd immunity in the United States, and let me emphasize, for us to have herd immunity in the United States, we would have to go from the half a million that we currently have who die to two and a half million people. I am not willing to see two and a half million of our fellow citizens die. Uh, in Manaus, they did antibody tests, but as I pointed out, that may not show the whole story in terms of herd immunity. These were the kind of pictures that have come out of Manaus. They just are tragic. We cannot afford to wait for herd immunity. So when you get uh, emails or people recommending herd immunity with uh, um, uh, statistics that are unproven and unsubstantiated, please don't listen to them. We need to avoid having herd immunity in the United States. Uh, it will lead to huge deaths. When will there be <clears throat> enough vaccines for the global population? This is a clinical professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. He thinks that we're about two years away from uh, without manufacturing expansion for being able to immunize worldwide for us to get on our planes or boats or cruises and go and visit uh, other parts of the world. So the important questions are, and this is really my last slide, uh, what are the safety issues when millions are vaccinated? Long-term follow-up, uh, very important that the databases are, are maintained. Challenges of giving two doses, just the logistics. How long will the vaccine remain effective? We talked about humoral and cellular immunity. Does the vaccine prevent asymptomatic disease and limit transmission is still a question. And the clinical trials did not include pregnant women, children, or immunocompromised patients. So that's it. I have um, taken you through a lot of medicine and hopefully uh, most of you are still awake 
And uh, I'm, I think Andy and I are happy to um, take questions. All right, excellent presentation as always. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, so I'm going to read, read off uh, some questions that appeared in the chat and also ask for people to raise their hands. And when I call on you, please do unmute yourself. But I'd like to kick it off myself. And I think this one is for Andy. Uh, Andy, uh, you've alluded to a difference between the, the publicized figure of 375,000 roughly deaths and, and what you believe to be 490,000. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understood you know, why there is that difference and how do you know that that's the difference? Well, I, I don't know that that's a difference. I mean, the CDC slide is a slide which is telling you how many people have died. And it is telling you that in the, in the framework of how many people traditionally die. And what's different is, you know, the pandemic. Uh, you know, certainly it would be, you'd be hard pressed to say that motor vehicle accidents uh, have gone up to that degree. I mean, if anything, there's probably a decrease in motor vehicle accidents causing deaths in the past nine months. Um, so it's a supposition. Um, and, it, and it's the reason I, I, I put up that slide and bring it because there are lots of concerns that the reporting has been on the low side. You know, uh, again, not to take this in a political direction, but that is a concern um, amongst the scientific community that, that we're just we're getting the lower numbers. Um, you know, look at look at how we view China. We say, oh, well, they're they're not reporting anything. Their their numbers are not to be trusted. You know, um, well, unfortunately, right now in this country, a lot of people aren't trusting a lot of things. So I, I put that up there as a slide that shows that we've had this almost half a million increase in deaths since this started. And I would just say you can take that for what it's worth and see if it plugs into what's going on around us. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start reading a couple of some of the questions that appeared in the chat. Um, now, let's see, somebody has, uh, Meredith Ernst has uh, stated that her second Madeira shot has been scheduled for 35 days after the initial, initial vaccination rather than 28. Is that okay? And a uh, follow-up question, what happens if the second shot is now given to new people and not given to those who already had the first shot? And so I guess the question is, uh, originally it was supposed to be a 28-day gap and now she's mm -hmm. hoping it's going to be longer. And now what happens if- Somebody is saying they're not getting it at all this stuff to have more first shots given out. How does that affect the people who have got their first shot? So Andy, you okay if I take this? Absolutely. Okay, so um, the story is a little bit more complicated. As, as um, per the news tonight, uh, the uh, administration has released all the stores of vaccines. Uh, they were held, we're holding back 50% to provide vaccines for the second round. The spread of the virus and the crisis in number of major cities in the United States just means we've got to speed up getting the first shot into people's arms. Now, we know that there's some immunity from giving the first shot. How much immunity may depend on how old you are. Uh, and the British have decided because of the crisis and catastrophe in the UK that they have decided they're going to try and get as many first shots into people's arms and even if it means a delay for the second shot. And there's some evidence, there's some evidence, particularly for the Pfizer vaccine, that if you 10 to 15, uh, I, hang on one second, 15 to 25 days after the first shot, that you still have about 80% plus uh, immunity. So we, we know that these uh, vaccines do work, not as well as getting two shots and waiting that 10 days, particularly for the elderly, older population, that's important. But we're in a massive crisis and public health people are trying to work out how best to deal with this. Now, whether you wait uh, 21 days or 28 days or 35 days, I don't think the science would say that that's a huge difference. Um, but we're gonna see some delays in the second shot because of the urgency of the problem. I was listening to reports tonight from Houston, Texas, uh, from Los Angeles County. It's, it's just tragic. Two major cities in the United States running out of oxygen, 
that they have portable morgues uh, stacked up outside the hospitals. We have to do something. This is, this is, we've been fortunate in Sarasota, we haven't seen this, but around the country, this is just awful. And the impact on uh, the healthcare profession who are working around the clock, exhausted, stressed out, uh, is just phenomenal. Uh, terrible situation. Uh, any insight on how to get the vaccine? So I guess there's, you know, everyone's stressed out about how they're even going to get it in the first place. We're all on getting on waiting lists and things like that. Yeah. Um, um, they can come to my house and I have a, a syringe and a needle this size. If you're willing to accept that size needle, then I will vaccinate you personally. But that's a joke aside. I have no idea. Um, I've been trying to get some friends vaccinated and uh, I have as much uh, difficulty as you do in trying to get on people's lists. I suspect over the next few weeks, it's gonna get easier as there is a huge bolus of new vaccines being distributed by the federal government. All right, there is, there is a question here that I'm guessing because you answered it already. Uh, every three, every th I'll just add, add, uh, add that every three days I go to Ben's house and I take that needle and I take it home and I wash it off very carefully and get it <laughs> back. So this is all very up and up. I want to make a couple of points just, uh, you know, as in between the questions. Uh, on Ben's slides, you saw, uh, uh, I believe it was Pfizer, that eight, eight people in the, in, the, in the arm that got the vaccine did get sick. As, as far as I know, I think the data from both studies, Moderna and Pfizer, showed that in that low number of people that got sick, people didn't get extremely sick. Um, there was an impact from the virus, even it wasn't to completely eliminate the, the infection. You know, the, these 95% figures that you heard on these uh, RNA, mRNA viruses is astounding. Uh, before we got to the point of knowing that, we were hoping for 60, 65, 70, there are years that the flu vaccine is 40 or 45% effective or late. So again, going back to, to the, the beginning of our talk, this is what we have. This and protecting yourself from the environment. Re remember, this is not a time to let COVID fatigue take over your thought process. Um, because we may have to wait a little bit longer for our second virus, which means that we may not have uh, our second uh, shot which means we may not have quite as much antibody as we would have liked to if things were, were being perfect. So again, I can't stress enough how we have to do what we can to keep ourselves safe. So that actually triggers a question from me then, um, because we know, or you have told, I believe you've told us that the traditional flu vaccines are the vaccines are from a killed virus, but this is not, this is the mRNA version uh, uh, approach. And there seems to be a tremendously higher uh, uh, effectiveness from the MR, mRNA approach. Is that, is that something that, that is, uh, am I stating it factually? Is, is it something that we can expect to be in, in terms of improving vaccines into the future? Yes, and I think the, the, the positive news is we, we will face uh, pandemics again in the future, inevitably. But the mRNA vaccine approach allows us to produce these vaccines very quickly and efficiently, much better than we were um, a year or two ago. So I, I'm enormously optimistic about the mRNA approach because A, it will uh, prevent or deal with the next pandemic, but also if this virus does mutate, that we can then produce a, a follow-up vaccine within weeks um, and be able to get that out. Thank you. Uh, a question from the chat. How would we expect people with autoimmune diseases, such as Crohn's, to react to the viral infection or to the vaccines? Um, so uh, there is no uh, contraindication for people with Crohn's to get the uh, vaccine. If somebody's immunocompromised, uh, say, for example, uh, on drugs uh, suppressing their immune system for cancer, then that's a different matter. But people who have autoimmune diseases like uh, uh, Crohn's, there's no contraindication to getting the vaccine. All right, thank you. And I don't know if you covered this in the slides, but do you have an update on the TB, uh, BCG vaccine studies for prevention of COVID? I didn't cover that uh, on the slide. And uh, um, I think the time has moved on now that we have these new vaccines. 
the whole BCG story has sort of drifted away. All right. When will it be safe for us to travel in the U.S. to see our grandchildren and their parents? I don't know if you can answer that. Well, you have to have an escort, which is either Andy or I. We have to fly first class, and then uh, it's very safe, and we will serve you the food. We will act as the airline stewardesses on the flight. No, but I'm being serious. I, I, I'm vaccinated. I made the decision that I, I continue to wear a mask in public and in private settings um, outside of the house. And, um, and I do social distancing and I will only eat outside of restaurants. I have been traveling uh, and I take the same precautions when I get on a plane, uh, masking, hand sanitization, and try as best as I can at the airports to socially distance. So that's the approach I've taken. I don't want to give people individual advice, but that's what I'm doing. This is a question from uh, one of our, one of our uh, uh, members here who is a physician. Uh, Pfizer reported on December uh, December 31st in the New England Journal that there are only 52% are immune with just one shot. Uh, how do you answer that? So uh, the 52% uh, is, uh, the, the uh, questioner is correct. The number was 52%. This was recalculated by the epidemiology branch of the National Health Service who were given access to the original data. And then when they stretched out that time after the first vaccine, so that 52% was a few days, I think it was up to 10 days after the vaccine. When you stretched it out to 15 to 25 days, that's when you got the 80% effectiveness. So the, the correct about the New England Journal article, but the, the British have redone the numbers. I have some questions about that, but that's what's led them to decide to really push uh, as many one doses as possible. Uh, another question comes from another physician who's watching long haul COVID. Explain what that this is and do only people with severe, with severe COVID get this or people with mild disease can also have long haul COVID. Andy, do you want to take this? I'm sorry, yeah, Joel, what? This question came from another physician who's, who's watching here. A long haul COVID, explain what this is and do only people with severe COVID get this or people with mild disease can also have long haul COVID? I am say long haul? That's, that's that. This came from Mark Ballow. Uh, Mark, if you want to unmute, maybe you want to. You, you're talking about like prolonged symptoms. Uh, Correct. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think you, we can predict who, you know, who that will affect. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I have as much information on that, uh, but I, I, I would not expect that, that there would be a target uh, population for that, which is, I think, one of the things that's so scary about the virus. Okay. So, so one, of, one, of, one of the places in the United States has actually set up a clinic for long haul COVID um, su subjects is Mount Sinai in New York. And from the reports from, they haven't done, published enough for us to know whether it's the mild cases, the moderate or severe that lead to the long haul. But uh, they are busy enough that they had to set up a separate clinic in New York City for long haul um, symptomatic people. Okay, and I think that uh, if I can just say, just uh, mention that, I mean, this virus can, affects many organ systems, not just the lung. A lot of people think it just causes pneumonia, but we know it causes thrombotic events. It can affect the yeah. kidney, affect the GI tract, and you know, people can be left with a, a lot of, you know, consequential disorders which haven't been well defined yet. That that that. They, <laughs> problem for a long time in these individuals. Correct. Thank you, Mark. Um, all right, last question in the chat, and then we'll see if people want to raise their hands. Is it necessary to wear a mask after receiving the vaccine? And if so, for how long? So um, I, I let Andy answer this as well. I, I was vaccinated back in, I got my first shot uh, August 8th, second shot four weeks later. I've worn a mask and can, will continue to wear a mask for a number of reasons. First of all, the effectiveness of the vaccine is only 95%. That doesn't, it means it's not 100%. Second of all, when I go out in public, people don't know that I've been vaccinated. I do think about getting a t-shirt that says, I am a proud vaccine recipient, but uh, shy of that, um, I think it's important uh, that uh, I uh, wear a, 
wear a face mask. And um, I, I think it's important that we continue to do that even after we're vaccinated. I think the state should give our face masks that, that we No, uh, I, I, I wonder if I could tell a joke. Go ahead, Iris. Okay. Um, it's, uh, a member of the Jewish community sent New Year's cards out to friends for the recent secular New Year's, and it said, we're wishing you a year of health, happiness, and, and uh, world peace. And may you be inscribed in the book of the vaccinated. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought the job was going to be a rabbi, a priest, and an imam going to a COVID clinic. But, all right. Um, does anybody want to raise their hands for, uh, for a question? Okay. Uh, Ted, unmute. I was going to try to answer one quick thing that it's with one case, and one case is not medicine. Uh, the basketball player from the University of Florida had tested positive for COVID-19, but he had not been sick with it, and he collapsed suddenly. It was developed had a cardiac disease that was myocarditis, which was assumed to be a complication of his COVID that he wasn't sick from. Yeah, um, actually, it just sparks my memory that I failed to say that the currently, the, the, for those of us who, if any of you have had COVID-19 and recovered, the current recommendation from the CDC and the NIH is that you do get vaccinated. So that's the current recommendation from the CDC. And it's 90 days, 90 days from your illness. Correct. I mean, 90 days from your illness. So. Correct. Now, I've got a lot of blank panels, so I can't always tell if somebody's got their hands up. But I believe, Hannah, you have your hand up on mute. Yeah. Um, what do you see or when do you see the possibility of us returning to Temple? Well, it's a good question. There's a COVID-19 um, task force. We have a meeting coming up shortly. Uh, I think that uh, my hope is that, uh, and people are talking about certainly by the Chagim, uh, Yom in Aroy, that we will uh, be back in shul for those of us who've been vaccinated. And there's a question that if enough of us get vaccinated in the meantime, about perhaps opening up the shul for people who are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, stay tuned. I know that uh, Eric Faber, the president, and, uh, and the others on the task force are really uh, trying to work out the best approach for this. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Paul. Andy, Andy, did I, can I ask something? Uh, Andy, did I hear you say a moment ago that you have to wait 90 days after recovering from the infection to get the vaccine? Yes. Because not the information that I received from one of your partners at the hospital. I recovered from the infection uh, and he said, get vaccinated immediately. He told me it was only after getting convalescent serum that you have to wait 90 days. Okay, I, I was under the impression that, that there was uh, that, that the recommendation was to wait 90 days. The, I, I personally, I, I think it would make sense to allow your natural antibodies to, to, to protect you for a while, especially in this, while we're having a vaccine crisis um, and then extend your period of, uh, of uh, immunity with the vaccine. Um, I'll look into that and get back to you. Yeah, that was, that was Manny. Manny told me that. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I I'll, I'll speak to Manny. We'll get back to you with an answer. Thank you. Right, thank you, Isaac. I think we have time for a couple of more. Paul, you had a question. Yeah. Is there any chance that the uh, sure will be involved in the dispensing of the vaccine? Well, um, personally, I'd love to see that happen. And the uh, circular driveway makes this more efficient for use in the large facility to set out an outside uh, vaccine center. I think it's, you know, I'm new to town. I don't have the political connections to do this, perhaps Andy, or perhaps some of you have the political connections either in, uh, um, uh, 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 in the capital or in the city town hall or with the local health department, but I would love to see TBS as a vaccine site. Yeah, I would just add that clearly the, 
you know, what you may have read about, there are seven or eight sites or, uh, um, uh, along the state, including some Baptist churches. I mean, that is, that's coming from the state and from the state through the health departments. I mean, I, I did specifically speak to the CEO at Sarasota Memorial, Ho Memorial Hospital. And although they were vaccinating people by the thousands, literally this weekend, they are certainly not, not the, the, the avenue to go for setting up uh, a separate uh, site. So I think it is a political thing. And I think mm -hmm. if someone feels that they have some clout, um, sure, why not? It, it, obviously it wouldn't be to get vaccine for our congregation, it would be to have our congregation, our site serve as a vaccination site. And obviously if that were the case, we would have some priority for our congregants. So let me jump in here a second. Um, there have been some very preliminary discussions on this subject. And I would say before anybody goes out and starts um, fishing around to make political connections that they have a discussion with Eric um, because there are pretty significant logistical needs that would have to be addressed before we could just do it. And we would need to have a pretty, pretty sizable staff of volunteers. That's part of their reasoning for doing it at other places. <clears throat> and we'd have to be able to support whatever is done. So it's not an easy decision and that's gonna have to be made at the board level. So don't go out and make commitments for the synagogue that can't be backed up until that decision has been made. And I, and I would just add to Elliot's point, don't forget about the refrigeration needs for this vaccine. Right. So uh, I see Randy, when you have your hand up. Yeah, along the lines of reopening the, uh, the synagogue and even places like theaters and restaurants, is there any research going on, and with more pandemic slightly, is there any research going on to how we can better clean our environment, uh, surfaces, air, you know, airflow, that kind of stuff, so we can be more prepared in the future? Um, okay. I'll take this and then Andy. Um, yeah. the, clearly one can contract the virus from uh, contaminated services. That was the original um, thought back in the spring when all of this started, that that was one of the major ways for transmission. We've learned that that's really not the major way. And the major way for transmission is actually a person to person through air droplets. And so it does raise interesting questions about the kind of air filtration systems we have in public facilities, the kind of uh, filters we have. And I know that the engineers are trying to work on this. I, I was listening to a podcast about this recently, and it's really interesting just what the engineering world is, is thinking about how to deal with that. And those would be the kind of things that could be done in restaurants or theaters or concert halls or in synagogues, etc. I have a, I have another question in chat, and a uh, gentleman asks, uh, he says, he states that his sister got the vaccine. Her arm has been swollen for several weeks. She keeps contacting a K11 and, is no res and there gets no response. Any thoughts on what she can do? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm reticent to give personal advice uh, to individual patients. Andy, do? I'm sorry, who's she trying to catch, uh, contact y'all? Well, uh, apparently she has called 311 seeking help and has gotten no response. And I guess she's feeling a little desperate at this point. And, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I think she, again, what I, she needs to go through her physician. I mean, I think that it's hard to imagine there's anything to do about that, but I think it needs to be reported. It needs to be noted um, and she needs to be examined. Um, but, you know, certainly there's no, antidote to the to the to the vaccine if in fact that's what's going on locally okay um this is very doesn't doesn't that suggest you may have a thrombosis that's that's a possibility that's why she needs yeah yeah i mean again i i think uh, any of us here would be reticent to make a diagnosis you know uh, specifically uh uh, over, over the over the over the Zoom here, I, I think she needs to go to her physician and go from there. That's reasonable. Sort it out. The, this is an Good point, Isaac. That I think we're just going to keep it going if there's no objection. Mark Ballow, go. 
I, I just wanted to tell people that when they get their vaccine, because I've had my first dose, you can sign up at a CDC site with an app and the app will uh, contact you every day and ask you about symptoms. They have your phone number and part of the app is permission to call you if you experience some unusual symptoms. So I, I encourage that when you do get your vaccine, uh, sign up for the CDC site that you know wants to follow you know individuals who uh, may not tolerate these vaccines uh, well. All right. Um, uh, Isaac Calvary. I'm going to um, uh, uh, talk about the elephant in the room, which is hydroxychloroquine. Um, hydroxychloroquine has been used in so many countries all over the world. It's been used in the United States, most of it anecdotally, but there are some studies showing the, the benefit in the very early phase, uh, certainly not in the late phase when you've got the cytokine storm. Um, it's a five-day course, it's extremely safe. And I must tell you, at the first hint that I had a low-grade fever and lost my taste, I began my course of hydroxychloroquine. I was asymptomatic within, within 24 hours. Now, this is all anecdotal, but I, I understand how politicized this has become. I don't understand why um, it, it's gotten such a bad rap when it's such a safe drug, short course, and may have some uh, efficacy. So I, I, you know, Isaac, uh, I, I don't know you, and, I, and I'm sure that what you're saying uh, you, you believe, but I, I think it's important that we don't encourage members of the community to take hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the scientific studies in the literature published in major scientific journals have not shown no benefit from hydroxychloroquine and have shown some cardiac side effects. So I would stick with the science that we know that is published and I would be reticent for people to walk away from the Zoom thinking that we are advocating for people to take hydroxychloroquine. And I would, add, I would add that in this patient population with uh, existing comorbidities and medications, that it's not a benign drug. 